Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum of Iowa. The Iowa History 101 webinars share Iowa stories and the history of the state through a cultural history lens on the second and fourth Thursdays of each month. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today we will learn about B.O. Wolden and other early Iowa naturalists. Together we will consider what those what those who experienced the radical alteration of the prairie bioregion during their lifetimes can teach us about the natural history and the beginnings of the conservation movement. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague Matt Byer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our presenter, Amy Adams. Amy is an essayist whose writing interests include narrative nonfiction, place writing, and biography. She earned an MFA in creative writing at Washington State and is soon to be certified as an Iowa Master Naturalist. Her essays have been published in Midwest Review, Rootstock, and Pensive, among others. Amy loves learning about Iowa's natural history and the people who've shaped it. She lives in Ames, where she works on a community garden. And now I'm very happy to turn it over to Amy to begin the webinar. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jennifer, for that introduction. Um, I'm talking to you today from Ames, from my house, where the power just went out about half an hour ago. Um, so I'm here on the phone for this Zoom meeting. Um, so I can't see anything that's going on, but I, I know that you're there, and I'm excited that you're here with me um, for this conversation today. So hopefully my first slide is up. Um, and this is just my background slide. I want to start off by sharing just a little bit more about who I am and how I became interested in these 19th and 20th century naturalists in Iowa. So like Jennifer said, my name is Amy. I'm originally from Northern Iowa. I'm living in Ames now. And before moving to Ames, I lived in Colorado for a few years. And it was really during that time that I was living outside of Iowa that made me realize um, just what a deep connection I have to this land and how much love I have for this place. So while I was living in Colorado, I was in a graduate program in creative writing uh, through a school out in Washington. And uh, I kept writing all of these essays about Iowa while I was in school. I was really interested in Iowa's natural history and I did a lot of research about a place in Northern Iowa that's called High Lake, it's in Emmett County. And um, I was doing that research because that was a place that was really special to me. I had worked at a summer camp in that area and was just really taken um, by the lakes and the woods. And it was this place in Iowa that kind of felt wild to me um, in a way that I hadn't really experienced anywhere else. And so, I was doing research for a writing project. And while I was doing that research, I realized that what I was really searching for was a window into the past. And I was reading things like newspaper articles and geological reports. And in doing all of that, I was really trying to recreate the tall grass prairie in my imagination. So sometimes people like to ask the question kind of as an icebreaker, if you could go anywhere in the world, where would you go? And my answer for that question, at least right now, has both a time and a place. I would love to visit Iowa in about 1830 and to see the Prairie Lakes region of Northern Iowa, especially, and all of that seemingly endless tall grass prairie with my own eyes. 
So going back to this writing project that I was working on, um, one day I found an article published by an anonymous author called The Observer. And that article was titled, Early History of High Lake Revealed in Records. It was published in 1931. And this article held many answers to the questions that I was asking about High Lake. And I was really excited to find it. I wanted to know who this anonymous observer was. And then I found out that this was a pseudonym used by Olaf Wolden, who was an, a naturalist in Emmett County. And it turned out that he contributed a regular column called Nature Notes to the Esterville Daily News for almost 40 years. Started in 1930 um, and went until 1968, um, just a month before he died about was when he published his last article. So since the Esterville Public Library had a digital archive of all these newspapers, I started tracking down more of his articles and typing them up into a Word document. I just, I thought they were fun to read. I, I wanted to keep some of them as a reference for future writing projects. And this was all happening in May of 2020. So I was working from home and I had a lot of free time on my hands. And I created quite an archive of these articles when I found out that the University of Iowa had a special collection that contained some of Mr. Wolden's journals and his letters. I got really excited about that. They sent me scans of those and I looked through all of them. Um, and that all contributed to this one essay that I was writing um, about the, this history of High Lake. And I finished it and then I kind of put those materials on the back burner, not exactly sure what I would do with them. And so it was kind of in the meantime there that I moved back to Iowa and came to Ames. And then this spring, I had the opportunity to take part in the Iowa Master Naturalist Program. And this is a 12-week course that's led by a series of volunteer instructors who all teach about Iowa's natural history. And I'll include um, a link to their website at the end of my presentation because they are a really wonderful resource for anyone who wants to learn more about Iowa's ecosystems and plants and wildlife. So the final component of this naturalist class is a capstone project. And I decided that I wanted to write a short biography of Olaf Wolden and combine it with a selection of his newspaper articles. And I got permission from the newspaper to reprint a bunch of his articles. And so I'm working on compiling those along with this biography into a book that I'm calling The Observer, The Life and Writings of Bert Olaf Wolden. So all of that finally brings us to what I will be talking about today. Today, I'm going to share an introduction to a few naturalists and botanists who lived and worked in Iowa during what I'm calling the Aldo Leopold era. Although Leopold lived from 1887 to 1948, and as we probably all know, his land ethic and his writings were some of the most important in shaping the modern environmental movement, especially in this country. And I think that this Although Leopold era and those two to three decades prior to it were an important and a pivotal time in Iowa's history. Famously, it was Aldo Leopold who said that the first wave of pioneers settled the land and the second wave studied it. So none of the people we are going to meet today had firsthand experience with a fully intact tall grass prairie biome, but many experienced the prairie and the vanishing prairie in their early childhoods and teenage years. And all of them had elders in their communities who could vividly recall a time when the Iowa landscape looked vastly different than the one we have today. So what I'm hoping is that we'll take some time to think about those childhood experiences and the stories that shaped the lives of these naturalists and scientists. And I'm hoping that these brief introductions that I'm going to give you to a few people today will give you a glimpse into this time period in Iowa, the Iowa history that I think is really fascinating and maybe spark a desire in you to learn more. All right, 
So let's begin and go to our next slide. And on this slide, it's called what's going on in Iowa. And let's just take a minute to look at these maps. And I'm guessing that what they have to illustrate might be familiar to you, or at the very least, what these maps are illustrating probably isn't going to come as much of a surprise, but maybe it will. And I kind of think that this should be shocking to us, even if it isn't anymore because we're used to it. But we are living here in Iowa in one of the most ecologically altered ecosystems on the earth. And when I think back to the education that I received growing up here in public schools, I know that the prairie and the history of Iowa were definitely things that my teachers talked about and taught about, but it really took years for the extent of our changed landscape to sink in for me in a personal way. Um, my elementary school had an outdoor classroom that had a small prairie and we would go out and have class and walks in it. And I remember as a kid that I didn't like it. Um, I remember that it was hot and muggy and there were lots of bees and wasps and things that could sting you and the grasses were much taller than I was and so it made me feel a little claustrophobic and then in college I took a nature writing class where we took this field trip and we walked around just the edge of a prairie reconstruction and so for me that kind of really symbolizes this long time in my life where the prairie wasn't something that I could really immerse myself in or something that I wanted to. So we might look at these maps where tall grass prairie covers more than 80% of the Iowa landscape pre-European American settlement, and we might feel some disbelief. We might struggle to stitch together all these minuscule prairie remnants that we've seen throughout our lives and envision them as an unbroken whole. I know that that is something that's really hard for me to do um, and also a thought experiment that I like to do at the same time. And maybe uh, for some of us, we've been to the Lust Hills or Hayden Prairie or Neil Smith Prairie. And maybe that gives a window in your imagination that brings you a little closer to what this landscape would have looked like. And then on the other hand, like many of these first Europeans and Americans who settled these vast grasslands, maybe you feel some fear thinking about that much prairie, that much open, unprotected space and big, big sky. But this was our land as it looked um, from the time when the climate began, began to favor trees over grasses, or sorry, excuse me, grasses over trees until about the 1840s. Tallgrass prairie dominated the landscape, trees favored river valleys and lake shores and the bluffs along the Mississippi River. And we, oh, and I wanna stop here um, and talk about, talk about this 80% prairie um, because this is something that I didn't understand for a while. Um, and I wanna make sure that we know that all of this prairie wasn't just this undifferentiated sea of grass. All prairie is unique. There are different kinds of prairies that thrive under specific conditions. So in Iowa, we have dry prairie, and that tends to cover gravelly knolls and hilltops with shorter grasses. And then we have wet prairie that fills in lowlands and sloughs. We have prairie rivers that are surrounded by grasses and other wetlands. And then we have mesic or medium prairie that takes advantage of places that are just right. They're not too wet or too dry. We also have oak savannas, open light filled woodlands inhabited by oaks and grasses. And then in each of these different types of prairie environments, there are plants that have specific ranges throughout the state. So in native prairies, you're only going to find the flower prairie smoke in northeastern Iowa. You won't find it growing naturally somewhere like the Lust Hills. You'll find yucca in the Lust Hills, 
but you're not going to find it anywhere else in the state in its natural habitat. So another important feature of the prairie landscape were its disturbers. There were large herds of elk, deer, and bison that roamed and grazed the prairie. Late summer fires raced over the land and cleared away dead organic matter, making way for new growth. And billions of birds migrated along the Mississippi River corridor, including flocks of passenger pigeons that were so massive that people couldn't see the sky for days at a time while they were migrating. They just darkened the whole sky. Iowa had wolves and bears, especially in Northeast Iowa in the more wooded regions. Our woodlands and waterways were home to beavers, fishers, otters, and many other fur-bearing animals. Instead of pheasants flocking, we had prairie chickens and the prairie resonated with their booming calls in the spring. So when we see prairie remnants today, they are mostly absent of all these other creatures that made this extensive ecosystem what it was. So with all of that in mind, we'll turn to the landscape that we have now, and we'll talk a little bit about how we got there. We know that pioneers turned Iowa into a land dominated by agriculture in less than a generation. This transformation of Iowa into a hardworking landscape was aided by land grants, railroads, the demand from Eastern cities for agricultural products, and the romantic notion of the frontier. And obviously there's a lot to unpack about what got us to where we are. And we don't have time for that today, so we'll save it for another time. But for now, let's look at a few key moments that mark the transition between the historic landscape and our modern one. So on this next slide, you'll see on the left, a map of what Iowa's landscape looked like in 2009. Notice that the gray is now corn and soybeans, and the yellow, which was prairie on the first map, is now grassland or pasture. And let's just sit with this for a minute. Um, look at the waterways, look at the forest, notice the orange areas of human habitation, and just take a minute to try to find where you live on this map. So over on the right, I've made a small timeline with some dates that I think are interesting or significant. And like I mentioned earlier, this presentation grew from my specific interest in Northwestern Iowa. And the first written record I found that mentions High Lake came from the Allen Expedition of 1844. At that time, there were no pioneers or agriculturists who are living on the land in Northwest Iowa. But then less than 30 years later, by 1870, there was no land left in Iowa that could be considered frontier. By that time, hundreds of native communities had been displaced, millions of acres of prairie and woodland had been cleared for agriculture. And then five years after that, in 1875, the Iowa Academy of Science was founded. And I think it's significant to notice that by the time Iowa had a formal organization at the state level, which had members studying and writing about the landscape, cataloging plants and animals, they were literally racing against time to record their observations before species went extinct or were extirpated from Iowa. And then lastly, I've included 1900 when Iowa's rural population density peaked because many of the naturalists were going to meet were born in the late 1880s or so. And this shows that their childhood intersected with this brief time when prairie remnants were still struggling for survival in a landscape that was becoming increasingly subdivided by farming families and communities. So we can go on to the next slide. And with all of this background in mind, I'm going to introduce you to the naturalist and botanist, 
that we're going to talk about over the next maybe 25 minutes or so. And I made this simple map to show where these people were born or where they worked as a naturalist. And of course, these are just a few people I'm interested in and some of whom I picked because they were working in landscapes that I really have an affinity for. And I do want to stop and encourage you, um, whatever part of Iowa you are in, to learn about naturalists in your own place, um, whether those are people who are active now or people from a different time period. Um, but this is something that's really fun and I think can really connect us. Um, to our unique habitats that we're living in. So starting the bottom right, we have Aldo Leopold, who lived in southeastern Iowa during his child childhood, and Thomas McBride, who grew up nearby. We have Ada Hayden, who was born and raised in central Iowa, in Story County. We have R.I. Craddy and B.O. Woolden, and his wife, Ida Iverson, in Emmett County. And then we'll also talk a little about the Lakeside Laboratory in Dickinson County. We can go to the next slide. And here we have Aldo Leopold. We're going to start with him um, since I'm using his lifetime as kind of a frame for this presentation. And that's simply because I think he is more of a household name in conservation and the environmental movement. And so I thought he might ground us in that sense, um, especially for those of us for whom this might be a newer topic. So Aldo Leopold was born in 1887 in southeastern Iowa, and he died somewhat young, unfortunately, in Wisconsin when he was fighting a fire on a neighbor's farm. His seminal work, A Sand County Almanac, was published by his family the year after his death. And he was born in Burlington, Iowa, had much of his childhood and early education here. So we definitely get to claim him as an Iowan. Um, but much of his work was in the American Southwest and in Wisconsin. So among his many accomplishments, Aldo Leopold was an author, a naturalist, scientist, ecologist, forester, conservationist, and environmentalist. And throughout this presentation, we'll talk a little more about the difference between conservation and preservation, how those are defined and how they're practiced. But Aldo Leopold was born into a family that loved the outdoors. His father got him interested in woodcraft and hunting from a young age. And he also enjoyed exploring the bluffs along the Mississippi River by himself. He was a birder. And over time, he became more interested in nature observation than in hunting. He had his early schooling in Iowa, and then he went on to Yale to study forestry in a department that was funded by a forester who became known as a key leader in the conservation movement. And so it's important to know that conservation during this time period that's called the progressive era was Sorry, um, it supported an efficient use of resources. So the conservation ethic was really focused on the living generation and their needs. And it paid mind to the well being of future generations, but that was secondary. And this was really all focused on human communities. This was conservation that was focused on utility and use of resources for the benefit of humans. So things that were going on in the conservation movement were things like landscape engineering. Dams were being constructed, waterways were being made navigable, and that was all happening in the name of conservation. So after receiving this education in forestry from Yale, which was really focused on a forest industry, Leopold went on to work for the Forest Service in Arizona, New Mexico, and then he went to work in Wisconsin, and there he became a professor in game management. And while he was working as a forester, Leopold had many firsthand experiences that caused him to start thinking about ecosystems as a whole. He was thinking about biotic communities, about the relationship and the interdependence between animals and forests and people. So he is credited 
as one of the first thinkers, at least from a Western perspective, that began to value an ecocentric model, which was a relational land ethic that wasn't concerned about conservation as a way to make human lives better and more comfortable. And he rejected that sense of utilitarianism that was being espoused by leaders of the conservation movement of his day. He was moving toward more of a preservation ethic. And his work really did create a shift um, and set a course for the modern environmental movement. And that was exemplified by his work in the Forest Service, the way that he lived on his land in Wisconsin and the teaching that he did. So I have a quote on this slide um, that I think just kind of sums up his land ethic really succinctly. And then if you want to learn more about Aldo Leopold, um, I'm going to do this on every slide. I'm going to have a recommendation for a further reading suggestion. And then those will all get sent out in an email as well. So now we can go to the next slide and talk about Ada Hayden. Ada Hayden was born a couple years before Aldo Leopold and lived a couple years longer than he did. She was born on a farm northwest of Ames, which is actually near Ada Hayden Park, if you happen to know where that is. She was, again, among many accomplishments, a botanist, an educator, a preservationist, a curator, and a prairie conservationist. The farm where she grew up fueled her love of natural places from an early age. Its varied terrain included gravelly knolls with past flowers that bloomed in the spring and wet areas with marsh marigolds and lady slipper orchids. When she was young, she would bring wildflowers to school. And in her formative years, she was mentored by Lewis Tamil, who was a leading Iowa botanist of the day and a professor at Iowa State. He actually started off as a one-man botany department at Iowa State. And so Ada Hayden went on to study botany at Iowa State, and then she went on to Washington University in St. Louis for graduate work in botany. She returned to Iowa State, and she became the first woman to receive a PhD there. And she was the fourth person total to receive a PhD from Iowa State. So a really impressive accomplishment. And after receiving her degree, she took a job as a professor of botany. She worked at Iowa State for over three decades. And during that time, her career became focused on prairie conservation. She worked to save and preserve numerous prairie remnants throughout the state. And the largest intact prairie remnant outside the Lust Hills, a place that she studied, is named Hayden Prairie in her memory. During her career, Hayden conducted extensive field work documenting prairie species. She took over the role of curator of the Iowa State Herbarium from R.I. Craddy, and we're going to talk about him shortly. And her work had such an impact on the herbarium that it was renamed in her honor in 1987. While acting as a curator, she expanded the collection. She integrated the collections of others including her own, which had more than 14,000 high quality plant specimens. She was very detailed in her descriptions of her specimens, of the habitats where plants were found, and she had an eye for detail and an exactness in her identification that cleared up misidentifications from earlier years. So after her death, um, Hayden has really been remembered for this important legacy she has been honored in multiple ways. And just as we might credit Aldo Leopold for spurring a national shift in environmental consciousness, we undoubtedly have Ada Hayden to thank for pushing Iowans to appreciate and protect the endangered tall grass prairie within our state. In 1919, she began calling for the establishment of prairie preserves, but it took years for her to gain support. She received $100 from the Iowa Academy of Science, and she used it to travel throughout the state studying prairie remnants. In the 1940s, 
Hayden brought detailed surveys of 22 prairie tracts in 10 counties before the Iowa Academy of Science with recommendations for their preservation. And these surveys included maps, geological, topographical, and floristic descriptions. They were accompanied by original pictures. And something that's really interesting about Hayden is that she took photographs, which were black and white, of the different places that she visited. And then she turned those into slides that she hand colored using over a dozen different colors of paint. She was also a very descriptive and poetic writer. And so to me, this is what makes Ada Hayden a really memorable naturalist. She was well-educated, she was well-versed in the scientific community, but she had an artistic and passionate side that enabled her to persuade scientists and to make connections with the public as well. And her love and enthusiasm for prairies certainly seems to be contagious. A quote of hers is, the prairie flora is an inspiration and most prized when it's gone forever. And although the titles of conservationist and preservationist are used somewhat interchangeably to describe her work, it's clear that Hayden's concern was ensuring that the prairie community would survive. Her mentor, Lewis Pamel, was influential in the creation of the Iowa State Park System which was really focused on woodland environments for the time, at that time. And the state parks, as we know, are there for the good of the whole biotic community and also for the enjoyment of people. They embody what we might describe as a more conservationist approach. The state parks have paved roads, they have campgrounds, hiking trails, and infrastructure that's in place to provide an efficient means for humans to interact with the environment. State preserves, however, exist primarily as refuges for plants and animals who inhabit them rather than for human use. Many are intentionally underdeveloped as to remain undisturbed. Camping is not permitted in state preserves. And humans are absolutely welcome to visit and to explore, but we're asked to leave a lighter trace when we're in these places. And so I do want to acknowledge that neither of these conservation or preservation is a perfect land ethic. Both have pros and cons. They're definitely not mutually exclusive. They're often used together. And we should remember too that these pockets of preservation don't return us to that pre-settlement landscape that we talked about in the beginning. Those vital disturbers, the grazing animals, the fires, the native people that have been displaced from this landscape. Are the, this, those things mean that these state preserves, um, they're not the places that they once were, and they're not places that could be if we imagined a different kind of land ethic. Um, they're places that hold a lot of possibility. But Ada Hayden's advocacy for preservation was absolutely crucial to the development of our state preserve board for the protection of our state preserves, which include many prairies and many different kinds of like prairies, um, like sand prairies, and they're very special places. So if you want to learn more about Ada Hayden, there's a really wonderful video presentation that's available on YouTube that was given by the current director of the Ada Hayden Herbarium, Deb Lewis. Um, I'll include a link to that as well. So now we're going to move on to a lesser known naturalist on the next slide, but I think he's pretty cool. Oh, I forgot. Um, we have a little video. Um, sorry, that's what happens when I can't see my slides. Um, so there's a little video um, from Hayden Prairie, um, just of some of the flowers that were out there. Um, it's a video from the Iowa Prairie Girl. Um, so we can watch that little clip quick. Pulpit. So stay tuned for my next videos. This is the Iowa Prairie Girl from Ada Hayden Prairie.
Awesome. Um, oh. Just think it's nice to drop in some little multimedia things in here um, so we can see these places um, that these people really loved. And just think that is a nice way. Um, yeah, to get to know these people that we get to know these people by um, understanding and experiencing the landscapes that were really meaningful to them. So um, now we're going to talk about a uh, lesser known naturalist who I think is pretty cool. And that is Mr. R.I. Craddy. And he was born about 20 years earlier than Aldo Leopold and Ada Hayden, but he didn't come to Iowa until he was an adult. So on the slide, I'm calling his formative years, um, those first years that he was in Iowa. And he does help us see a little bit further back into the past. Um, Freddie was born in 1853 in Pennsylvania, and he made his way to Armstrong, Iowa in 1877, where he worked as a rural school teacher and a farmer. In his early adulthood, he became very interested in plants and how plant communities and farmers could interact um, in more of a healthy and balanced way. And he had a passion for rural education, and he eventually became the superintendent of Emmett County. So something that's really interesting about Craddy, uh, he published a flora of Emmett County in 1904 with the Iowa Academy of Science. And in that paper, he talks about how he was fortunate to live at a time where he says that nine tenths of the original habitats in Emmett County were still intact. And he's talking about the prairies and the bogs and the wooded areas around the lakes. So he was out and about in the field um, in this kind of grassroots, self-taught way, observing the landscape um, as more of a lay person at first than a scientist, but he just had so much available to him. And so he had the landscape available to him. He had um, connections with people in Dickinson County who were studying and doing surveys over there. Um, these people would go on to found Lakeside Laboratory, scholars like Thomas McBride and Lewis Pamel. And so Craddy got to know these people and he became quite the skilled botanist. In 1918, he retired from teaching and he moved to Ames and took over curation of the herbarium from Pamel. So it was Pamel, and then Craddy, and then Ada Hayden after him. And during that time when he was at Iowa State, he contributed a series of plant notes to the Iowa Academy of Science. And those brought the findings of these people um, that we're meeting today into conversation with each other. And so I include him because I think that he kind of an interesting link in this community, um, people like Pamela and Hayden, and B.O. Wolden, who we're gonna talk about soon. And as far as his values, his ethic, he was passionate about protecting prairie plants and balancing that preservation with practical agriculture. He was also interested in educating the ordinary people um, about the landscapes that they inhabited and the children as well. The quote that's on the slide is from a former student of Craddy's remembering that he was always pointing out the different flowers in their seasons um, when the children were going to school. So we will go on and go over next door to talk about people who are working in Dickinson County. And although I've listed Thomas McBride as a Dickinson County naturalist, I'm not really convinced that this is the best place for him. Although Dickinson County attracted a large number of naturalists and botanists because of its unique environment, the lakes, the sloughs, the kettle holes, and the plants and animals associated with them, these people would come for brief stints for a season, and then they would leave again. And so for that reason, it took longer for a flora of Dickinson County to be produced and published by the Iowa Academy of Science than it did for other counties because there were few naturalists, um, at least that I'm aware of, and I would love to know if any of you are aware of people um, who are living in Dickinson County year round during this time period and really getting to know the land there. 
so Thomas McBride has connections up there and then also down in Southern Iowa. He was born in Tennessee, moved to Southern Iowa as a child, and he grew up on a farm as well, like Hayden, um, like Fatty. When he got older, he studied at Lenox College, and there he met a man named Samuel Calvin, with whom he would go on to found Lakeside Labs. They collaborated on prairie studies while they were together at Lenox, and then Calvin got a job at the University of Iowa. He helped McBride get hired on as well, and McBride eventually became the head of the, de of the botany department there. Um, he was an authority on slime molds. That was his specialty in the field of botanical studies. So Lakeside Laboratory was founded as a field station in 1909 with a mission to teach Iowans about Iowa through direct observation. And Okaboji made for an ideal location because it was an ecotone situated between the Western Plains and the Eastern Forest, as all of Iowa is that kind of an ecotone. And then to the north, there was the comparatively new landscape of the Des Moines lobe that was um, scoured by the Wisconsin Glacier. And then to the south, the Little Sioux River Valley showed evidence of a more geologically ancient landscape. The Okaboji region itself featured mixed grass prairie, prairie potholes, marshes, and prairie rivers. So there's kind of something for everyone there in the field of natural history. And like I mentioned back in the introduction, these early years at Lakeside were heavily focused on description. These naturalists were working to catalog species of plants and animals and describe native plants before their habitats disappeared. So given the nature of that cataloging work, it makes sense that McBride valued the professionalization of botanical studies. He was in favor of cataloging, naming, systematizing. And I think that it's likely that those were things he cared about because he wanted more people to have access to information more easily. Conservation was important to him, um, but preservation was probably more important. He had an interest in geological features and rare plants. So he wanted to see ecosystems left intact for their own sake and for study rather than using places efficiently. Uh, when the grounds at Lakeside were expanded, that was important in sparing much of the land from development when Okaboji became a popular vacation destination. And McBride also played a role in the development of the Iowa State Park. So if you are interested in learning more about Thomas McBride, you can find his autobiography in cabins and sod houses in a few scattered libraries in Iowa. Uh, some of the universities have copies of it. And I would also recommend the Iowa Lakeside Laboratory, A Century of Discovering the Nature of Nature. It's by Michael Lanou. Um, I think that's how you say his name. Um, and it's just, it's a short read, it's a good read. It has a lot of good history um, about Lakeside, if you are interested in that. So I do have another little video clip here. Um, maybe just watch like the first 30 seconds of it or so. Um, just wanna show you a little flyover of Lakeside Labs.
we can go ahead and keep going. Um, I like that video because it reminds me of Emmett County as well and the lake over there that I'm particularly interested in and a really beautiful spot and a really unique and interesting spot in Iowa. So we're going to go to the next slide and um, hop back over to Emmett County. And these are the folks I could talk about the longest and that's why I've saved them for last so I don't go overboard. Olaf Wolden was born at High Lake in Emmett County in 1886 and grew up exploring its varied landscape. Like Patty had stated in his 1904 paper, the 1870s through the 1890s were a time when a surprising amount of native landscape remained in Emmett County compared to other places in the state. So a young Olaf was able to observe a wide variety of plant and animal life on his walks to and from school to the rural school that he attended and on weekend hikes with his siblings in the woods. Mr. Wolden attended a rural school at High Lake through eighth grade and then continued his education in natural history and botany by reading the work of other Iowa naturalists and studying his older brother's college textbook. He met Craddy um, in kind of his adolescence, young adulthood, and they had a friendship that lasted throughout the years. They collaborated, they wrote each other letters, um, and stayed in touch about happenings in Emmett County. And unlike other people that we have discussed so far, Olaf never attended or worked for a university. His career was as a farmer and a rural mail carrier. And so both of those jobs allowed him direct access to the natural world in all seasons, and his travels gave him a wide understanding of Emmett County. Because of his proximity to Lakeside, Olaf was able to work with many noted botanists of the day, including the bryologist, Dr. Henry Kennard, and the two authored a paper on the mosses of Dickinson County that was based largely on Mr. Wolden's field work. So he had a special interest in mosses and plants. Um, we're definitely leaning into naturalists who had an affinity for plants um, because I like plants. Uh, but Olaf Wolden is maybe the most diverse of the naturalists that we've looked at so far. Um, really knew a little bit about a lot of things. And that is most evident in his prolific writing. So he published um, about half a dozen scientific papers and he authored his own Flora of Emmett County in 1932 and revised it in 1956. But his lasting work was not in academia, but in educating the public. Mr. Wolden contributed a nature column to the Esterville newspaper for almost 40 years, in which he wrote small essays about all kinds of plants, birds, animals, and nature observations in the county. Uh, he tracked the weather and the seasons, and birds and plants definitely showed up the most throughout his articles. Throughout his life, he valued the preservation of wild plants and wild places, he valued observation and attention to the natural world and sharing his appreciation for the many varied wonders of nature with others. This was a vocation that Olaf shared with his wife, Ida Iverson. Ida was born in Grinnell in 1896 to a farming family and they loved to grow flowers. Um, she was educated in rural schools. She studied at Grinnell College. From there, she went to the University of Iowa. She studied biology and botany. And then she began a career teaching biology at the high school and the junior college level. She also worked as a rural school teacher after marrying Olaf and moving to Emmett County. Ida authored a book called Our Friends of the Trees. Um, she gave talks about her work. She led hikes for Girl Scouts and civic organizations. She spoke on radio programs. 
she had a very social approach to her education and work as a naturalist. Um, Ida was an avid birder and a member of the Iowa Ornithologist Union. And like her husband, she also valued access to nature education for all people and all ages. And so um, for further reading about the Wolden, um, like I said, I have this book that I'm working on and uh, it's going to be available soon, um, maybe by the end of this year, for sure by the spring. And uh, proceeds from that book are going to go to the Nature Center in Emmett County uh, to support access to nature education for all people um, in memory of these Emmett County residents who really valued that. So we can go on to the next slide. And this is bringing us to an end to this introduction to some of Iowa's naturalists. And I hope this presentation taught you something new that maybe it sparked your curiosity either to learn more about some of these folks or naturalists in your own area. And I hope you'll take a bit of that naturalist imagination out into the world to explore your place and to get to know the biotic community that you are a part of. We are the people who have inherited the work that these naturalists devoted much of their lives to. And it's up to us to continue their work of conservation, preservation, and natural history education in Iowa. When we remember and pass on the legacy of these 19th and 20th century naturalists, we strengthen the links from our generation to generations of Iowans who lived in a landscape quite different than the one we have inherited. Earlier this summer, I went on a prairie walk led by Tom Rosenberg from Drake University at Doolittle Prairie, which is in Story County. And he said something that really struck me. He said that the disappearance of the Tallgrass Prairie was caused by a lot of people doing a little bit and that prairie restoration takes the same course. We need a lot of people to do a little bit to restore and rehabilitate this vast and beautiful ecosystem. So your little bit might be planting native plants in your yard or garden, maybe to fund a grant or join an organization or advocate for the environment in any other creative way. But I do hope that these naturalists might inspire you to do your little bit, whatever it is. So um, here is just a rundown of some places that you can go um, for more information. Again, this will be sent out in an email, um, so I won't dwell on it for too long. But Iowa Master Naturalist Program, a really great way to build a knowledge base of Iowa's natural history. Um, other natural history, national, natural heritage organizations, um, the Iowa Nat Natural Heritage Foundation, the Iowa Native Plant Society, the Iowa chapter of the Nature Conservancy. Um, if you are interested in looking at proceedings of the Iowa Academy of Science, you can find those available online through the University of Northern Iowa. Um, and my website is on here with information um, about the book. We'll be on there soon, not yet, but it's coming. Um, so thank you so much for listening to me. And I would love to open up the rest of our time um, for a few questions. Of course. Well, thank you, Amy. We have a little bit of time for some questions. If you have a question, though, please put it in the Q&A feature here on Zoom. Um, but please note, we are short on time today, so we may not be able to get to all of them. But let's dig right in. Um, our first question, um, in your research, what skills or characteristics did you find were common in early conservationists? Um, I think something that came up a lot and something that is talked about in that book that I mentioned about the early history of the Lakeside Lab was um, so much inquisitiveness, um, so much curiosity, uh, a desire for firsthand experiences to really go out and see things in the world um, for yourself. And something that I think was so exciting um, about this time period or kind of makes me almost wish I lived in this time period is that so much was new, um, especially in the field of botany, 
that you could get in and be involved just because you thought something was cool, um, no matter how much formal education you had. So thinking about Olaf Wolden and his work with mosses, um, he was in this moss society and he was one of the first hundred people to join it. And he was publishing things um, just about what he was seeing um, and things that he had taught himself and learned through reading the works of others, um, not having like that formal college education. So um, I think that that inquisitiveness and that drive was something that a lot of these people shared. Perfect, and our next question, um, how were women like Ada Hayden treated within the early conservationist field? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, and something that I don't know a ton about um, in the, the presentation about Ada Hayden that Deb Lewis has, uh, she talks about how there was an encouragement for women to be involved in botany. Um, and that's something that I saw in the Lakeside Lab as well. Um, I think especially through Iowa State and University of Iowa, um, there was an emphasis on having men and women in the field. And I do notice, um, kind of like in the tribute to Ada Hayden that are out there, um, that people really talk about how she was strong-willed and a little eccentric um, and a little feisty, which I think is great and fun. Um, but it is interesting to me that there are those comments about her. And I didn't feel like I saw comments about men um, like that in the same way when I was reading tributes to some of these other folks. Um, so I think that women were pretty well respected um, and that there was just like at all places and times, kind of this just negotiation between people about how to how to make a, a welcoming and an inclusive space for everyone. Um, that's why I really wanted to talk about Ida Iverson as well, um, because I think in my research into um, Olaf's life that like she was kind of secondary, um, but she's really, really cool and interesting herself. And she had a lot of her own accomplishments. So that was something that was important to me to try to talk about both of them as much as I could. That's great. And this will be our last question today. It keeps on time. Um, let's end with a recommendation. Um, any recommendations for local prairie areas for people to visit? Oh, yes. Um, so many. So the Iowa State Preserves are really cool. Um, and I really like seeing remnant prairies, um, Doolittle Prairie in Story County. Um, and oh, there's a, a really tiny prairie um, that's in Clear Lake, Hoffman Prairie, that's like just right off of Highway 18, um, but it's cool. And yeah, just look up Iowa State Preserves. There's 89 of them. There's so many places to explore. That's great. And with that answer, we'll bring the webinar to a close today. Uh, thank you to everyone joining us. And I'd like to extend one last thank you to our presenter, Amy. Thank you so much. Thank you. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. Now, for more information and to register for future webinars in this series, please check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. And while you're there, you can check some of our other things out. We have our digital programming, such as our Goldie's Kids Club for young historians. We look forward to virtually seeing you here again on Thursday, November 10th. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.